many years ago I started thinking, I was watching Billy Graham and he was in his 80s and I was thinking, what's going to happen when Billy Graham dies? Who's going who's gonna to take on this legacy? He has been preaching for most of his life and in my head I thought, what happens when people like that leave this earth? Is there anybody that's going to go ahead and, and carry on that same tradition of speaking for God? And then, you know, a few years ago, my father started getting old, and I thought, well, what's going to happen when our fathers start disappearing? And all of a sudden, my friends, close workers that I have, started losing their dads just one by one right after another. This year was my turn. We lost my dad about a month ago. And I spent about the last three or four months probably getting to know him better, better than I did most of my life. I didn't think it was going to start like this. <clears throat> How do we go on when we lose somebody that has been such an anchor in our life? What do we do? What do we do with all the lessons that they've taught us? And how do we keep their memories alive? The one way is by sharing with other people about that loved one. Another way is, is living on with the legacy, with the things that they've taught us. Let's, I'm going to go to Proverbs. Chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. It's a lesson that's true. If you spend enough time with your kids, you'll understand. Sometimes it seems like the, the lessons that we're trying to teach our kids fall on deaf ears. And I think as they get older, they, they reflect on those things and they look back. I'm going to tell you some of the lessons that I've learned from my dad. One of the lessons was don't hold on too tightly to the things of this earth. My dad had his own business, and he could have had anything that he wanted, but he chose to help others with his finances rather than just care about himself. He was very generous and shared and took care of the poor, and that's another legacy that I, I feel that my dad instilled in, in each one of us in his family is to take care of those that are in, in need and less fortunate. There's another verse in Proverbs, 1717 a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for times of adversity part of taking care of those people in need is that they are our brothers another thing that my dad taught me was use the abilities that God has given you if we go to the book of Ephesians I can quote the first two but not the third one Verses 8, 9, and 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance. God has things that he wants each one of us to do, and he's actually prepared them ahead of us. And he wants us to look for those opportunities when he gives them to us. Another thing that my dad taught me was stand up for the things that you believe in. You know, most of the things that my dad taught me come from the Bible. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you, and he will leave you and never forsake you. One of the lessons I think that my dad really taught me was to learn how to live out your faith, to have your own experiences, to learn what your faith is. I don't have my dad's faith. I have my faith. And my kids, they have their faith. We have to learn to experience life the way God wants us to. He challenges each one of us 
in different areas, and he wants us to step out in faith and to do the things that he's called us to do. He wants us to exercise that faith. The other thing is, each one of us, God wants to do great things through us. He just wants us to be there to, to be the messenger for it. The one thing that I really thought about, and I spoke at my dad's sermon, is in Ecclesiastes. And it talks, Ecclesiastes talks about the futility of life. This is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and I'm going to go uh, to verse 1 in chapter 12. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. But do know that for all these things, will, God will bring you to judgment. Banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are meaningless. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. You know, when I was young, I never really thought about the days of trouble. And then as you get old, and you buy cars and you own property and you have insurance and you have 401ks and it's just like, wow, it seems like the troubles just pile up and the thoughts that, that uh, make it so you can't sleep at night and the things that you worry about your kids going to college and different things. And um, God's telling us to think about the things in life and that we are going to be held accountable for what we've done with our life. There's one more verse here. Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. My favorite verse is uh, one that I learned, and uh, we had it at our, at our wedding as, as kind of our life verse. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I don't know if anybody can see this. Can anybody see what that is? Close. It's a compass. Does anybody know how a compass works? Compass always points one direction, north. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this compass right here. Um, I grew up different than most of you people did. My father and my grandfather, they grew up in the woods. They were woodsmen from northern Wisconsin. and. Uh, my grandpa would spend close to a month in the woods two or three times a year. He was a logger and he was what's called a cruiser. He would go through raw land and figure out how much timber there was and what it would be worth to a, a mill to cut it all down. So he would spend sometimes up to a month in the woods. My dad wouldn't see him for long stretches of time. This to them was like a Bible. If you don't have this and you get lost, you could die. And uh, I grew up in a heritage where all the men in our family hunted. My dad, his brothers, my grandpa. And the first time I went on a big hunt, I took this with me. My dad taught me how to use it. And he said, if you get lost while you're in the woods, I want you to shoot your gun three times rapidly, then we know you're lost. And so we hunted all day and we hiked a long ways. We were six hours into Michigan and we hiked probably two hours into the woods. And they said around three o'clock, everybody head back towards the car if we haven't seen a deer. And we all started heading back, but we were all probably a mile from each other. And it started to snow and snow and snow. 
And I started hiking back to the car, and I was hiking for over an hour. And I got, I got to where I thought the car should be, and I quit trusting my compass because I didn't see the car when I thought I should. I was 50 yards from the car, and I started running parallel to the road. So I was really lost. Luckily, my dad had heard the three shots, and he came and found me. And I learned that day that you have to know how to read a compass, but you also have to know how to trust the compass. In life, the thing that my dad taught me was this should be our compass. Amen. We have to learn to read the compass, and we have to learn to trust the compass. God's word doesn't lie to us. If, usually if there's a mistake, it's on our part, not God's word. And so I really learned a lesson that day from my dad. And the other thing was, I understood that when I shot those three shots, that he would be coming. I knew that he wouldn't abandon me out in the woods. God doesn't abandon his people. If you feel like you're lost today, don't. Because God is always looking for us. You know, if we are going the wrong direction, you know what the Bible says? All we have to do is turn and God is there. Just make that one step. Turn and God is there. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I, what I chose to do with my life. Um, some of you have seen that I'm kind of a short, tiny guy. <laughs> I wanted to become a professional athlete. And my goal every year was weight training, running, lifting weights, playing baseball, and playing football. And I did it every day. I tried to swing a bat almost every day for almost five years. I used to put weights on my bat to strengthen my arms. My dad said he never saw anybody hit a ball as far as I could. And I trained and I trained and I overtrained. And when I overtrained, <clears throat> I got cut from the baseball team and it crushed me because I had trained on a machine rather than real people. I had practiced all my life, but I had never practiced against real people. I had practiced against the machine for too long. And I could hit anything out of the machine, and when it came to a real pitcher, the mound is 20 feet further, and the balls are completely different speeds than when they come out of a machine. And so I had to learn to retrain myself to do things the right way, to slow things down. I was swinging way too fast. And so I learned how to play, and about at the time when I started getting really good, we also had started a Bible study at our church. And a lot of the kids that I grew up with in our church, we started asking just friends to come and try it, and it grew, and it grew, and we started out with four guys, and we ended up with 25 guys. And what ended up happening was, we started all having a much deeper relationship with Christ. And we started sharing with people who were lost. And one of the things that, that happened that was really hard was a, one of the guys that I had started this Bible study with was in a motorcycle accident and died right in the middle of this study that we had started. And after he died, it changed the whole trajectory of my life. Baseball didn't matter anymore. Work didn't matter anymore. Food didn't matter anymore. He was 19 years old. He had his whole life ahead of him. I got, I got so depressed, I, I couldn't work. I couldn't sleep. I didn't know what to do with my life because I thought that could happen to any one of us at any moment in time. And then I started thinking much more about the deeper things of life. What happens to us when we die? Do we really believe that, that we will be in heaven one day? Is this a fairy tale? And you know, the things, that, the things that I had learned as a child, were they true? Could I trust them? And I went on a journey. I tell you, I started working. I started making money. I had a good job. And I wasn't happy. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't happy. And then the Lord started talking to me. And he said, Troy, you have all the things that you've ever wanted. Are you any happier than you were before? And in my head, I was like, actually, no, I'm not. 
So over, over the course of a year, I sold my house. I quit my job. I built a trailer and I headed for Alaska. And I thought, you know what, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you at your word. I'm going to follow you and trust that you will take care of me. And I started reading my Bible in depth every day. And I started praying every day. And I went on this journey. I drove from Minnesota up to Canada and all the way through Alaska. And I met other people who were doing exactly what I was doing. They were tired of their job. They were tired of life. And they really were in search of something. And none of us actually knew what we were going to find. And, you know, when I was up there, I met one police officer. And he said, you know, the thing about Alaska, he said, is there's two people here. There's religious nuts and criminals. <laughs> and he said, I, I seem to have trouble with both of them always. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my word, I hope that's not going to be me. <laughs> so I, anyway, after studying my Bible, I really felt like the lessons that God was teaching me were starting to really like impact my life. And I got to one point, there's one point that you can drive to in Alaska and there's a big sign and it says, this is the very furthest western port, point of North America. I drove all the way there. I got to that sign, I took a picture of it. And while I was looking at that sign, I felt the Lord saying to me, if I can take you there, will you trust me to take you anywhere? And I just got chills while I was looking at that sign. And I thought, God took me all the way there to tell me that's not where he wanted me, but he wanted me to listen to him and follow him and trust him. Well, when I came home, when I came home, things had changed. Real estate went crazy. I couldn't afford a house. I could barely afford an apartment. When I left, jobs were everywhere. When I came back, I couldn't find a job. So my whole life had changed just in a course of 40 days. And uh, what I learned was I had to start all over again with nothing. But I had one thing. I had God and I had my faith. So I put my trust in Him. And, um, you know, the one thing that I found out was while I was on that journey, I was only concerned about the destination. I, I knew I wanted to get to Alaska. And when I got there, I told people, that was not the prettiest part of my trip. The prettiest part of my trip was all across Canada. But I never took time to stop and enjoy it because I was too busy getting to Alaska. And you know, sometimes in life, we're so concerned about the destination that we don't enjoy the journey. You know, God put the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. Part of their life was not just the destination to the promised land. It was the experience. They were with God every day. And they didn't know what they had right in their hands. They had God at their beck and call. But they were so concerned about getting to the promised land that they lost sight of who, who was helping them get there and who was supplying all of their needs and helping them through their hard times. You know, um, I have a few verses. Uh, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and sup with him. John 14.6 and 7 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Um, let's do one more in Ephesians. I think I read this already, but I'm going to repeat it. For by grace you have been saved by faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not by works so that nobody can boast. For we are God's work, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Um, you know, when my friend died in that motorcycle accident, at that time, that was the first time I ever did a public speech. I spoke at his funeral, and there was 2,000 people in attendance. And 
I think I had more people at that funeral ask me how to become a Christian because God told me then, every opportunity you have to share, share about me, share the way, help people find out. Um, I, I was talking in the first service, you know, we're going through very hard times in the world, in this country, and a lot of people are lost. A lot of people are looking for some direction. And for those of us who know the way, we're supposed to be guides. We're supposed to be helping those people find their way. Um, if any of you feel lost today, I just want you to know this should be our compass as we navigate through life. I just really hope that um, especially for the kids, that you'll listen to the things that your dads are, and parents are trying to teach you. Sometimes I think my dad thought things fell on deaf ears, but they never did. We may not have been listening at the time, but deep down, those, those things are in our hearts. Those are the memories that we'll take with us for the rest of our lives.